It's not every day that you get an email from the White House, especially if you happen to be a tiny company with half a dozen employees, no revenue, actually, to be honest, no business plan. And no, it wasn't me that actually got the email. I'm, of course, talking about one of the founders of Twitter. And if you cast your mind back to about June last year, when one of the co-founders of Twitter was sitting down on a Saturday morning, having his cup of coffee, turns on his computer, and there it was, the email. Shocking. But even more shocking was the next line. We've been reading your blog. We noticed that you plan to go offline next Tuesday. Do you mind delaying it for a couple of weeks? He was astonished. What could possibly have got the State Department so interested in his maintenance schedule? Well, the answer was actually thousands of kilometers away, where something extraordinary was already starting to take place. You see, the Iran elections had just started, and they'd been widely known to be rigged. But this year, rather than just protest in the normal ways, the people of Iran were gathering together collaborating on Twitter, using Twitter to circumvent the censorship of the government, the controls of the media. It seemed like an extraordinary moment for democracy and the potential of the internet to change the world and make it free. But I'm here to tell you the story is a little bit more complicated than that. You see, we're moving into a new era. It's an era where the platforms of the world are not just controlled by the West Coast of America. They're controlled by countries that we can't even imagine. In a sense, there are two internets rising. The internet of the West and the internet of what I'm going to tell you about today, the divergence. And these two internets and the conflict between them will shape the web that we know. Because the web that you thought you knew actually never really existed. But today, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to tell you the story of its future. And to do that, I'm going to ask you three questions. The first question is this. Who will shape the future of the web? Now, last year, I was lucky enough to speak at Gultagen, and I talked to you a bit about my last book, Futuretainment. And a special thank you to all the weird and wonderful people who sent me their picture of themselves with my book. Um, there's some here I can't even publish. Um, it's always a terrifying moment as an author when you discover who your readers really are. Anyway, the idea in Futuretainment was that what happens to the world when all the consumers become connected? Because essentially it's a new order where connectivity leads to a state change in the way we do business and media. But actually, when I've had a year to think about it, I realized I left out a very important part of the story. And before I tell you what that is, I'd like to do a small experiment. Who here has got teenage children? Please, please put up your hands. Okay, it's quite a few of you. I guess it's quite lonely in the winter months of Norway. What I'd like you to do is the people who put up your hands, please turn to the person next to you and tell them what is the worst thing your teenage son or daughter has done recently. Please do it now. Don't be shy. Because they weren't. Okay, we, have we all found out something dreadful? Well, I'd like you to consider this. Your teenage daughter isn't the only problem you have. You see, the internet also is a teenager. Its birth year was 94. And you could almost apply a developmental psychology model to the internet, which might explain some of the problems that we're having now, trying to figure out what career the internet should have or what it should do with its future. When you look closely, though, at the development of the internet, it's not just one story. And there's actually a secret history on the childhood of the internet, what I call the secret history of the divergence. So let's start at the beginning, when the internet was just a baby, 94. Now, of course, the internet's big brother, the PC, was already 19 years old, and believe me, was more than a little unhappy with his sudden arrival of its younger sibling. A couple of years later, now you can see here in yellow, this is things that were happening in the West versus things happening in the areas of the divergence that I'll be explaining about. So by the time the internet turned two, Hotmail had launched and somebody had bought their first Palm Pilot. 
15 years later, someone would buy their last Palm Pilot. But we won't talk about that. Now, in that year, the first internet cafe opened up in Shanghai. Internet cafes would come to represent over 30% of the way that people in China would access the internet. Age 5, 1999. Another kid, Sean Fanning, managed to make himself the most hated man in the entertainment industry. How? Well, of course, he invented Napster and no one paid for music again. But over in another part of the world, in China, QQ was founded, a social network that many of you might not have heard of. But a few years later, it would have 900 million accounts and make a billion dollars US in revenue. The year 2000, the internet turned six. DVD went mass market in the United States. A former mathematician and linguistic expert in Russia set up a website to take on what eventually would be the search market. They went number one, and believe me, they still are, even though Google have tried for years to topple them. In 2003, the internet turned nine. A musician called Gilberto Gil became the Minister for Culture in Brazil. He set up 650 free internet culture centers across the country, giving people access to digital media. 2004, Google goes IPO. A young gamer in China became the first person to win a court case against a video game. You'll be pleased to know his biochemical virtual weapons were restored to him. eBay's local CEO was arrested because someone was selling pornographic images on that website. 2005, when the internet turned 11, MySpace started being used by out-of-work musicians in Los Angeles. Meanwhile, in Brazil, Orkut went mass market, and the Brazilians managed to scare off everyone else in the world who might have used Google's social networking service. And we don't even care for clothes. Age 12, 2006, the first tweet was sent. If only they were to know how many Norwegians would one day take over the service. But a Russian website, all of MP3, was sued for $1.65 trillion by the music industry, who were a little bit unhappy that the Russians were stealing the music, but, you know, ahead of Steve Jobs, were selling it for a dollar to consumers. One thing you can say about the Russians, they may be criminals, but they know how to make money. 2007, the iPhone and the PlayStation 3 launch. But over one million iPhones were actually sold on the grey market in China, even before it had launched. Live Journal was taken from the Americans and moved to Russia, where it was the number one blogging platform. Age 14, 2008, with 253 million users, China becomes the largest web market in the world, and also in the same year manages to host the Olympic Games. 2009, last year, Russian hackers deliver a massive attack against a Georgian blogger, and as collateral damage, managed to bring down Twitter. And in 2010, the iPad launches in the United States. But in India, mobile web traffic hits 1 billion requests per month, doubling every year, and Google leaves China. Now think about this. In 2024, the internet will stop being a child and start becoming an adult. It'll be 30 years old. How will it look? How will the technologies we use work? But most importantly, what will be the largest influences on the web. The message I want to give you today is that it's actually the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, rather than the United States and Europe, that will have the biggest role in shaping the future of the internet. I'm not going to talk about necessarily the technologies that we'll be using. I mean, who knows? But I can tell you about the cultural and consumer models. And the starting point for that is demographics. This is a very interesting map behind me, because what it shows you is a map skewed towards the population of the people that will be living in the future. And by 2030, a third of the population increase in the world will come from two countries, India and China. By 2050, when we have 9 billion people on the planet, over the vast majority of the population will live in these emerging countries. And of course, yes, it's about economic power. When you look at the top seven economies of the world in 2008, the ones behind me now, and you add a few years forwards, you can see the dramatic change by 2026. China's overtaken the United States, India has overtaken Japan, Brazil's overtaken Germany, and Russia has been let into the club. It's not just money, of course. These are some photos I, I took in Norway when I was at Gultagen last year. And one of the fascinating things behind the shift in growth in the BRIC countries is the rise of the middle class. And no, it isn't because everyone has moved to Scandinavia. In fact, 
You can see here, the rest of China is now 40% almost of the world's middle class by 2030, and India about 6%. The other story here, besides money and power, of course, is the rise of the internet. And if you look since the birth of the web in the early um, 1990s, you can see the story of the rise of the BRIC countries, which are even in this moment as we speak, moving ahead of the United States. So look at, look at it now, it's quite beautiful the way it tracks. China moving ahead of Japan, Brazil moving ahead of Germany, and then just recently, the last couple of years, China moving way ahead. So that's just to last year. What happens now in another 20 years? And I believe the secret to that lies in this graph. You can see here, this is the absolute numbers of web users in the world. Now, what's intriguing about this is when you look at those BRIC countries, because regardless of how many people use the internet in those countries, look how low the penetration rates are. So China, with 360 million users, is still at only 26%. India, with 81 million users, is still only at 7% of its potential. So when you look at that, you realize that as the internet develops, there's going to be a massive shift in power. And it's that shift in power that I'm particularly interested about. Now, I know royalty at the moment is a very sensitive topic in Scandinavia. I mean, I, I learned on the weekend that it's actually not so bad for Norway because the world discovered, as I did, that, well, actually, Norwegian girls are more preferable than Swedish princesses. But in a way as well, is the question of power with the BRIC countries, I believe, comes down to what I call the three crowns. The first crown is economic power. There's no doubts about this. You saw in the facts I just gave you, the rise of the purchasing power of those economies. But the second crown is more subtle. It's what I call age power. Because all of us in the West, unfortunately, and some more than others, are getting older. And by 2030, we will be positively senile. Whereas in the BRIC countries, they'll be young, they'll be dynamic, they'll have a higher proportion of their population in the workforce. And of course, the third crown is what I call soft power or cultural power. Because you can't have that many people on the internet with that many young people and economic power without actually having an influence over culture as well. So when you look at all those factors, it really leads you to one inescapable conclusion. When I look at the logo of Apple, I always think of the irony because it reminds me of a graph. What is the missing chunk in the Apple logo? Well, it might be this, 14%. Do you know what that is? That is currently the percentage of Americans who constitute the global World Wide Web. This is the rest of the Apple, 86%. That's now. So it's very easy to read TechCrunch and to read Twitter and all the blogs and to imagine in the echo chamber that the world is completely driven by what I call web coast um, etiquette. But the truth is very different. And how much longer can we really believe that the United States will continue to be the dominant force on the web? So to summarize this point, I believe that the most powerful future influence in the web will be the digital emergence of the BRIC nations, supported not just by economics, but by their relative strength in youth demographics and cultural influence.